Mark chapter 6, verse 14. Jesus' name had become well known. And some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. But when Herod, King Herod, heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead? For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested. And he had him bound and put in prison. And he did this because, make sure to follow this, Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. So he married his sister-in-law. Okay? So when you go to a family reunion, you never know. You may end up finding your special someone. Okay? It says, for John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to, to have your brother's wife. And, and so Herodias nursed a grudge. Everybody say she nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. Verse 21, though, says, finally the opportunity came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials, military commanders, and leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. Now, we don't know what kind of dance this was. Could have been the, could have been the Dougie. Could have been the floss. Maybe the hokey pokey, for all we know. But everybody liked it. And the king said to the girl, Ask for anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? And her mother said, the head of John the Baptist, the head of John the Baptist, because she nursed a grudge. Um, how many of you could openly admit here today that um, you are a germaphobe? Any, do I have any germaphobes? I see a few. Yep. I, definitely me. My, I, my hand is raised the highest. I am, yes, I am a germaphobe. We have jackets and everything. I'm the president of the club. We have jackets. They have gloves that come with them. Like, I'm a germaphobe. Um, and, um, and, and, like, when our kids are sick, quarantine. That's just the way I feel. Like, I can love you through the glass. You know, it just, um, in, in our vows, it did not say in sickness and in health. It said, at a distance till you're better. Okay, it just that, that's kind of how I feel about it. I will shake hands today, I will hug you, and I'll love every minute, and then I'll shower in hand sanitizer. That's just, that's just who I am. Now, for years, people probably thought I'm crazy, but now, in, in, as the world watches a pandemic unfolding, I don't look all that bad now. I'm like, yeah, look who had it right, you know. And next week, I'll be preaching in a suit, a hazmat suit. You know, that'll be what I carry until we're, we're kind of through this. But, but listen, the irony of, of this whole germaphobe idea and, and the irony of, of where our world is right now and that many of you have been spent the, the week watching as the world is concerned of this widespread infection, the irony that it is, is that there is an infection that has been spreading for, for since the dawn of humanity, and, and, and it's much more widespread. It's much more dangerous because it not only affects the body, it affects the soul and the spirit as well, and, and it's a 100% infection rate. Every person in this room, every single seat has been infected with it either currently or at some point in time. In the Greek, it, it would be called pikria, but in English, it's called unforgiveness. And then it's spread through all of our lives at some point, and it's spread through the house of Herod years ago. That the house of Herod had a visitation from this contamination, and that it resulted in the death of John the Baptist. Now, the, the, the Bible says that John was a fearless and, and really stern prophet, someone who would just call it like it is. I mean, he was a guy who, who, if a leader was in hypocrisy, he called it out. If a tax collector was greedy, he called it out. And, and if a king and a queen happened to be in adultery, he called it out. And the Bible says that, that he called out Herodias and Herod for their relationship. But, but it, it, we, we don't know um, the, the full detail, but it was enough to embarrass and offend Herodias. And, and, and don't take that too difficultly because, I mean, if I stood up here today and started saying, you in the third row, let's call you out for your sin, you'd probably be offended too. But the reality is that the Bible doesn't say she was just mad. It says she nursed a grudge. And when I heard that phrase, read that phrase, something just leaped on the inside of me that the Holy Spirit wanted me to, to follow. 
You see, the reality is, is that um, um, when I read that, the first thing I thought of was a medical nurse. How, how many medical nurses do we have here today? Do we have any, if anybody's sick, a couple? Okay, good. Um, medical nurse, so heroes. But when I, when I, and I felt like when I read it, the Holy Spirit asked me, what does a medical nurse do? Well, obviously, there's a very complex answer. At, but at its, at its core, a medical nurse will treat a patient until they are at their full strength. Treat a patient until they're at their full strength. And, and, and the Holy Spirit spoke deep in my heart as I'm reading this, and here's what he said, yes. And many people are nursing grudges until they are at full strength. And then he said this, people are medicating things that will one day make them miserable. And it just so gripped my heart, this idea of how we medicate and nurse a grudge. And I started thinking about it, and I, I thought a lot about the idea is, is that we don't recognize when we do it. Matter of fact, it's so natural to nurse a grudge that, that we may not even be able to outline the steps that we took. But yet many of us stand years later at something that happened in the past, and here we are nursing it to full strength and life. And that we, un, not realizing the danger that that brings to us when we nurse a grudge and what the end result is. And so today, I, I just want to spend a minute helping you see how we nurse a grudge because I just believe that, that, that the Holy Spirit's broken into our intent to show you that you may be, in fact, doing it. Now, when, when a grudge takes place, it starts as a hurt. And, and, and all of us get hurt. I mean, that's just part of life. See, the, the problem when, when it comes to life, life's going to hurt. In a room this size, there are betrayals, there are, there, are, there are accidents, there are attacks, there are abuses. Every seat has a story. Hurt is part of life. The problem, though, is when we, when we start to nurse the hurt, when we put it under our care. Because eventually what you care for, it will grow until you can't contain it. And if you let it linger long enough, it will become life-threatening. But the way that that process begins is you give the hurt a place to sit in your heart. That it starts when you give it a place to sit. Because a lot of hurts happen, but you don't give every hurt a place to sit in your heart. There's some hurts that stick a little more than others, and we say, you know what? Sit right here. Have a seat. Stick with me in this moment. Now, the problem is, is when you give, instead of letting it pass or choosing to release it quickly, when you let a hurt sit in your heart, you begin the treatment process. That you begin to give it what may be the most valuable commodity you own, you give it your attention. And the more that you give this hurt your attention, the more it becomes a place of influence in your life. That, that you, in, a, in, a, in effect, begin to, to look through life's lens with this hurt. See, it's a specific seat that we give hurts when we're nursing them. We don't give them a seat that stays at home. We give them a seat that travels with us. So when you got hurt at home, you're going to take it with you to the office. And when you got hurt at the office, you're going to take it with you back home. The hurt begins to travel with you. It begins to go not just where you go, but to end, end every relationship you have. A am I mistaken, or did it say that Herodias was the one with the grudge, but yet she carried it into the relationship she had with her daughter and into the relationship she also had with her husband? Because when you give a hurt a seat you're going to take it with you into every other relationship. But that's just the beginning. The next thing you're going to do when you give the hurt a seat and you begin to nurse it is you're going to have to give it breath. You're going to have to let it start to breathe. Because the truth is that, that, that if you just forgot about it, it would die. But, but the more you think about it, the more breath it gives to live. And so what we do is we begin to repeatedly think about our grudges. Now, they told me, they, I said, where did you get this? And they said, China. And I said, there ain't no way I'm putting that on my face. <laughs> but you get the point. You see, um, grudges are weak in their beginnings. They need oxygen. They need to, to have some room to breathe. And the way they breathe is when we start to think on them repeatedly. We think about it all day. We think about what they did and how they said it and what they should have done. Listen, I think there's two ways we think about it. And with every thought, we give it another breath. Um, the first one is, is that we, we will rehearse our hurts. Now, a rehearsal of hurts means you go back and relive it. 
You relive what they said and how it made you feel. You go back and relive what they did and what they didn't do. You, you end up rehashing or replaying the worst moments of your life again and again and again. Some people, though, don't rehearse their hurts. Some people rehash them. And rehashing means that you go back into it, and like an athlete who's looking at film, you start to pick apart every moment and see what you wish you had done. Has anybody here ever had an argument in their head with somebody else? I mean, I, if he says this, then I'm going to say that. And when he brings this up, I already got this locked and loaded to knock them out with. <laughs> Listen, um, when you're rehashing something, not only is your grudge breathing, but who do you think's feeding those thoughts to your mind? See, because um, it's your spiritual enemy. Um, a lot of times you think you're arguing just with yourself, but he's feeding you what to argue. And here's why. The Bible says that um, when anger lingers too long in our lives, we give a foothold or place to the devil. Now, that word place means a mental stronghold. We give him a place to sit and talk to us. So do you know what some of you are doing when you rehearse and you rehash old wounds? Not only is the grudge breathing and getting stronger with each breath, you're receiving counsel from the enemy on how to handle it. That the person telling you how to handle your hurt is the person who wants to hurt you. Now, we don't know how long it was from the time that Herodias was called out to the time she chopped off John's head. But what we know is the only reason it happened is because she let it breathe. She rehashed it and rehearsed it until it was breathed enough in that she could then take the final step, which is when the thoughts become actions. You see, when we begin to act on our hurts, we give it a special type of strength. And it's a strength that, that's similar to an IV when we get a hurt and we start to act on it, it's like a drip at a time starting to make that grudge stronger. Drip at a time starts to get it stronger. Drip at a time starts to give it more power in our lives. You see, um, now most of us um, probably don't act in retaliation. Now some of us might. Some of us might actually go as far to do something or try to hurt someone. Most people don't, re don't retaliate through actions. They retaliate through articulations. They just say stuff all the time. They, they comment on Facebook about the person, cryptically comment about the person. They, they, they tell other people about it. They retell the story anytime they get a chance. They gossip to others about how much they were done wrong. And, and, and it feels good. I mean, it feels good in the moment. It feels good to say that and get it out there and everything. But here's what we don't get. With every comment, there's another drip. And with every comment, there's another drip. And with every ounce of gossip, there's another drip. And in the process, what we think we're doing is just letting it out, but what we don't realize is we're actually shoring up our grudge's strength until what once was weak is now strong enough to stand up in your life. And guess what? When it's strong enough to stand up, you've become too weak and you have to sit down. See, that's what happens with grudges is, is that we nurse them long enough and they get strong enough that they stand up, but they make us weak and then they start pushing us around. You see, they start pushing us to where they think they, that we should go and they push us away from people that love us. They push us away from God's word. They push us away from our purpose. They push us away from God's plan that they end up taking us on a ride when we thought we were the ones in control the whole time. Because we nursed it to where it got strong enough to begin to hurt us. You say, well, are you sure that happens? Oh, absolutely. Because people who hold grudges, they end up losing three essential things that you and I both need. People who hold grudges, they miss out on some specific things. I I'll give them to you. Here's the first thing. When you hold a grudge, you get no rest. No rest. Listen, you need rest. Physically, your body wears out and you need rest. Well, did you know that your, your body um, or your emotions also need rest? And you have limited emotional energy. And the problem is, is that anger burns emotional energy more than any other emotion. So, so for every one that crying takes, anger takes so much more. And what happens is if you stay angry long enough, you use up all your emotional energy. 
And one day you choose to get out of bed physically, but your emotions don't get out of bed. They shut down. And that's what we call depression. Depression is when your emotions are so depleted that they're not working anymore. They've decided, I'm done. You go on. And then you don't feel low. You don't feel high. You don't feel good. You don't feel bad. You don't feel. Because your emotions have went on hiatus because you've kept anger for too long. Listen, the second most, promise, the second most common promise in Scripture from God to you is peace. Peace is essential to have rest. But you get no peace if you keep unforgiveness. Because peace and unforgiveness cannot coexist in the same heart. So when you choose to keep a grudge, you choose to not be at rest. Here's the second thing is, is when you choose to keep a grudge, you get no mercy. No mercy. Listen, I love in the scripture, it says the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. But not for people who don't forgive. Look, Jesus' own words, Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. As I studied that this week, I wanted there to be an ulterior motive to that. I wanted there to be another meaning to that verse. I think it's so clear because God wanted to make it so clear. You cut off mercy to other people, God cuts off mercy to you. Now listen, we need to take heed of that. And it seems harsh, but I want you to listen. From God's perspective, it doesn't seem harsh. Because when God looks at you and he sees how much he's forgiven you, and then he looks at what you will not forgive, it's dumbfounding to him. From his perspective, he just cannot comprehend how you would not forgive for this, no matter how difficult, awful it is, compared to how much he's forgiven you. And so he says, the only thing I can do reasonably is I will measure out mercy to you in the same measure you, mer you measure it out to other people. So in effect, when you keep a grudge, God cuts off the mercy. Now, historically, for, for um, Herodias, she cut off John the Baptist's head, showed him no mercy. A few years later, history records that an emperor changed and cut her off from her power, cut her off from Judea and put her into exile, and that she was then in, in a cut-off state. She died at 39 years old. She showed no mercy, and she received no mercy. Because when you cut it off, it's cut off from you. Listen, to God being unforgiving is unforgivable. That's, that's just the way he sees it. In light of how much he's forgiven you, he just cannot comprehend you wouldn't forgive someone else. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I need mercy. Therefore, I have decided I will not let what someone else does to me keep me from something I desperately need. I will not hold a grudge because I need mercy. Listen, you need mercy. You need it in your life. And you, but the only way you get it is to give it. Now, here's the last one. Um, people who hold a grudge ha get no power. No power whatsoever. And to live life without the Holy Spirit's power is miserable. It's miserable. Um, but God will not entrust power to someone who will not do the basics of the Christian faith. Forgiveness is 101 with God. Like, it's, it's the central, I mean, it, forgiveness is the very first thing that he lines up. It's what he said. So, he, he, forgiveness is 101, and he'll never entrust you with 301, 401, or 501 power until you can follow through with 101 forgiveness. He won't give it to you. And so, when you choose not to forgive, when you hold a grudge, here's what it means. You choose to forfeit God's best for your life. God's best only comes in his power. So when you choose to hold a grudge, you hold on to your own strength to provide for yourself, your own wisdom to make all your decisions, your own abilities to, to navigate your relationships, for your own personal ability to keep your body up. You get no power because you hold a grudge. And it's detrimental. I, I, I have a pastor friend. His name's Jerry Lawson. He's preached here before. He pastors in Alabama. He told me a story about a guy in their community who had... Um, on a farm, rough guy, not, not really a believer, but people knew him in the community. He had an accident where he was somehow working with livestock. As a matter of fact, it was a cow, and the cow 
um, kicked him and it paralyzed him from the waist down. And, um, and, and, and it was awful. And it took this hard guy and made him embittered. I mean, angry. Angry at doctors who couldn't heal him. Angry at insurance that wouldn't pay enough. Angry at God for not preventing. Angry at the cow for doing it. Angry. Bitter. So this pastor would visit with him often, and they would get nowhere. It was nothing but just vitriol. So angry at God. Why could God? How could God? Just vitriol. And so the pastor came on. It was about six months they had been in this process. The pastor came one day to visit, and he just was so fed up just hearing this guy just, just be so bitter. And, he, and, and the guy kept just, well, why hasn't God healed me? And God needs to heal me. And the, and, and the pastor said, listen here. It's real stern. He said, listen, God may want to heal you, but I guarantee it won't happen with your heart full of bitterness. And it kind of just shocked the guy. And he said, instead of me coming back here and listening to you just be angry, why don't we pray that God gets the anger out of your heart right now? And tears began to flow down the guy's face. He said, okay, and he bowed his head, and then the pastor led him through a simple prayer. God, will you flush the bitterness and the anger out of my heart? He said, you could tell peace immediately came over him. And he actually smiled a little, and they, they concluded their visit, and the pastor left. The next day was Sunday. And, um, and so the pastor gets up to preach, and he looks in the back, and, and the guy's there sitting on the back row in his wheelchair. And um, the guy hadn't been to church in years, so it was, it was, this is progress. pastor preaches the message, and, um, and then gives an invitation at the end. Those who want to surrender their full life to Christ, come forward and receive prayer down at the, at the front. And then that's when the gasps in the church started. Because people watched as that guy got up out of his wheelchair and walked down to the front of the church. He completely surrendered his life to Christ, was wonderfully saved, and completely healed. But listen, listen, listen. When you nurse a grudge, you negate the power of God in your life. But when you let go of a grudge, you let the power of God flow. And some of you are living right now without any flow. You're living without the thing you need to live. And so you've got to get rid of grudge. So I'm going to give you three things of how to give up a grudge. Three things. Super simple. And let me, let me just say this. Two things. Number one, um, they're very specific for you. These are not the typicals that you would see in a book. These, I got these in prayer specifically for people today. And number two, would you get this so I can get on to this series next week? Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Number one, um, you start by recognizing the source. Recognize the source. Imagine that you went to a doctor. You're sitting in the exam room. She walks in. She sees that you are running a fever, hears you coughing, um, sees your labored breathing, sees your glands are swollen, and she says to you, how long have you been sick? And you say, oh, I'm not sick. And she says, excuse me? I mean, obviously you're sick. You've got all the, how long have you been sick? She goes, oh, I'm not sick. That's how you get yourself referred to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Listen. I have done this long enough to know there are a lot of people showing symptoms of resentment and bitterness who swear they're not bitter and resentful. But the reality is, and I, and I think it's because we struggle with the label. We don't want to label ourselves bitter. It just seems extreme. I think we struggle with the idea that we want to think, well, it's just a little bit of frustration. It's not full-blown bitterness. Listen to me. If the symptoms are there, you need to be honest with yourself. If, if there's no peace, if there's no rest, if there's no power, if there's no mercy, if you're not growing, if, you have, if you're angry, you just need to be honest that the symptoms are there. But listen, don't just be honest that it's there. Be specific at how it got there. One of the things I've noticed is, is that people who were hurt and have nursed a grudge for a long period of time, they forget what actually hurt them. So they went from being mad at someone to just being mad. That They're mad at everybody now. Listen, some of you have worked in three different places, and you swear you found the three worst bosses on the planet. Some of you have been in three relationships, and you swore you found the three worst people on the planet. There's only one common denominator to that. And what you don't realize is, is that, that your anger has become the filter with which you see everything now. And you can't remember what you actually started the anger with. You just know you're angry. And that's what the enemy wants. He wants to cloud your understanding of where the source is because forgiveness is not a general thing. Forgiveness is a specific thing. Let me say it this way. Everywhere scripture talks about forgiveness, it talks about it in terms of accounting. Now, you know what I don't say to my accountant? Ah, just ballpark it. 
No, my accountant knows a specific number equals in a specific formula equals a specific result. A specific person and a specific hurt has to be identified to get a specific forgiveness. It's not just a general thing. You need to know what it started as. Listen, you're not mad. You're mad at someone. You weren't just randomly wounded. You were wounded by someone. And until you can know what that was, it's hard to ever forgive that person in that situation. So let me ask you, who hurt you? What'd they do? What do you feel like they owe you? Because until you can specify that, it's really hard to truly forgive. Now, here, here's the second one. After you recognize the source, you take responsibility. Um, one of the common misbeliefs, most common misbelief about forgiveness is, is it's something that happens to you. Like one day you're going to come up here and we're going to say a prayer and then you just walk away and you're, oh, man, I'm, just, I'm a forgiving person now. That one day you're going to hear a message and it's just going to make you into a forgiving person like there's just something happened. Listen, forgiveness in Scripture is never seen as an experience. It's always seen as an act of obedience. That's why in, in Ephesians 4.31, here's what it says. Get rid of, not get in a prayer line for. It says get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. It says be kind. It does not say that, that, that have someone pray over you. There's a magic wand. There's a scripture. It says be kind. Do it. You do it. It's your responsibility. And compassionate to one another. Forgiving. You forgive. Not, not, not like you find it and you stumble upon it. You do it in just the same way Christ forgave you. In essence, here's what Paul's saying. I'm not asking you to feel it. I'm asking you to do it. Paul never says you've got to feel it. He just says you've got to do it. Listen, with all my heart, I wish there was a switch that God could just flip in your heart. I, if there was, I, we, I wouldn't have even shared today. I would have just had you come forward. We would have prayed the prayer. You got the, the, the light switch would have went up, and you'd be a forgiving person. But that's not the way it works. Jesus did what you could not do, but you have to do what Jesus will not do. Jesus went to the cross and cleansed you of your sin. You could not do that for yourself. But Jesus will not forgive your ex-husband. Jesus will not forgive your friends. He will not forgive your coworker for you. That's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. Now listen, I'm going to say this as clearly and compassionately as I can. Many of you have held grudges for so long when someone like me says, give it up. Come on, give it up. You say, I can't. But scripturally, your I can't is really I won't. Scripturally. You think you can't, but according to scripture, it's really I won't. You got to take responsibility. Only you can do it. Here's the last one. Um, you need to refuse to resuscitate it. Some of you are nursing a grudge and you need to execute its DNR. That, that, that this will not be resuscitated in my life. And notice Paul says, get rid of all. You know why Paul said get rid of all? Because it seems small to you now that you think you can tolerate it, but he knows that you will nurse it and eventually it will be life-threatening to you. So he says, I don't care how small it is, get rid of it. Now, I'm going to give you two, two ways to do it. Two, these are the two steps of forgiveness. It's so simple, yet it is so difficult. Two steps, you're going to want to write this down for no other reason than you're going to have to do it 52,000 times, okay? Here we go. Number one, um, you need to decide they, whoever they is, owe you nothing. They don't owe you an apology. They don't owe you an explanation. They don't owe you a repayment. They don't owe you what they took. They do not owe you anything. That's what you have to decide. You are releasing them to God for him to deal with. And listen, releasing is not restoring. Those are two different things. Releasing means I'm not going to think on this all the time. And I'm not going to keep them in hate. I release them. But it doesn't mean they, that we get remarried. It doesn't mean that we, we start business together again. But you got to decide. 
that I'm, I'm, they don't owe me anything anymore. Here's number two. Listen, number two is essential. This is a two-part healing. One part will not do it. Two parts. Here's the second part. You have to declare a blessing over them. What? What? You got to declare a blessing. Here's why. Oh, I, I want you to get this. I'm telling you, this is, this, is, this is something that so many people miss. The reason you have to do this is because unforgiveness is most displayed through your mouth. Listen, I know you're unforgiving by talking to you. You know I'm holding a grudge by talking to me. So if it's most displayed through our mouths, it's also most destroyed through our mouths. And that's the reason we have to bless. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, 28, he said, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you. He said, listen, you've been perpetuating the nursing process with your mouth, now you can end it with your mouth. But you have to bless them. So what does it mean to bless them? It means that you pray for them what you pray for yourself. It just means I, I want as much for them as I want for me, as I want for my kids. What I, the best prayers I got, I'm gonna start praying over their life. And listen, it takes time. You're not going to start off there. You know, most of the time we start off with God, don't kill him today. Amen. But it'll move from God, don't kill him today. Amen. To God, I pray that you truly have your will in their life and their whole heart comes to you and that God, you can pour out your love for them in the same way you poured it out for me. Listen, here's why this is important. You decide with your head, but when you bless, it forces what's in your head into your heart. Let me say it this way. You've not forgiven until you can bless them. So you just got to do it. Um, Kayla and I, um, when, when she was pregnant with our first, we, um, we were a two-income home, and we decided we wanted her to stay home when she, when she had the baby. And I had been working, planning for this, and a central part of the plan was I was going to start a second career, a second job, um, doing consulting for churches on business stuff, like, like the, the business side of church. I, I'm... I'm gifted to do that. And so I, we're going we're gonna to help do that to other churches that needed that help. And I'd spent two years building a network, building credibility, really working towards this. And, um, and wouldn't you know it, just at the time that we found out she was pregnant, God opened a door for me to lead 20 pastors through a two-year program. And that, those 20 pastors, what they would give me would more than pay for Kayla's salary. And God was just so good. He opened that up. Isn't that great? Well, listen, um, about four months before that was supposed to start, I got a call from the leader of that group of pastors. And he said, you know, Joe, we're really, um, I hate to tell you this, we're not going to go with you. We're going with such and such who happened to be a peer of mine, another consultant. And I said, what do you mean? And, and he said, well, he's been calling us a lot. And he's been talking to us about what he offers. And, and to be honest with you, Joe, here's what he said. He said, this is your first time doing this and we shouldn't step out with someone so inexperienced. And um, have you ever been hot and hurt? Like both? Like I was hurt because I a team member, but I was hot because that's just wrong. You go calling other people's clients and, and, and saying that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and so I began to nurse a grudge. And, um, and, and I, 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 in my mind, had a little torture chamber I had assembled. And I drug that guy in there every day. I put him on one of those wheels that spins and I threw knives at it every day as in my mind listen and then i could talk about it with anyone listen people who didn't even know who he was i could get any conversation back to how despicable he was it didn't matter if they had how's the weather today i'll tell you how the weather is it's, it's not hot enough for some people in this world who need it like i could get any conversation back to that but you know what else followed no mercy no peace no power, no rest. I remember fear in that season. I'm not wondering how I was going to pay for this baby. I remember Kayla and I being at, at each other because of, of that fear. I remember the hurt and the pain and the frustration. I remember no grace. Listen, I remember wasting months that I should have been enjoying our first pregnancy, worried about how I was going to provide because there was no mercy, no power, no rest. 
And one day I was reading it, and First Peter 2.23 says of Jesus that he went through all this, the, 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 this, I mean, unbelievable things, the beatings and the crucifixion. And it says, but he chose not to retaliate. And First Peter 2.23 says this, and he, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Here's what it's saying. Jesus could have stopped at any point the foolishness of the cross. He could have stopped the beatings. He could have stopped the cross. He could have stopped the whole thing. But he said, you know what? I'm not going to stop it. I'm not going to retaliate. I'm going to trust myself to God, and I believe he always brings justice. And when I read that, I heard the Holy Spirit just say to me, if you trust me, you can forgive him. And here's what he meant. Joe, he's not taking anything from you that I can't put back. Because, listen, you're not banking on someone else. No one can give you a wound that God can't heal. No one can break you to the point he can't put you back together. No one can steal from you something that God won't put back and provide. He said, don't worry about him, Joe. You entrust yourself to me, and I'll take care of him, and I'll take care of you. And so I decided to forgive, and I, I began to forgive. And I began to forgive because it's a process. I mean, I, I decided, and then I'd bless him, kind of, and then I'd decide, and I'd bless kind of, and again, and again, and again, and I just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. But listen, what happened is, is that every time I would bless him, there was another drip of peace that would come into me. And I'd bless him, drip of peace. i bless him, drip of peace. i bless him, drip of peace. And eventually, I was strong enough to get up out of that grudge and let it stop pushing me around. Two weeks before the... Um, the, the group was to start, I got a call from the owner of the company that both me and this other consultant worked for. And here's what he said. He said, hey, what's going on? I, he- I heard that there was a switch. What happened? And that was my opportunity to seize and say, well, I'll tell you what he did. This But I said, nothing. I, I said, that group chose to go with someone else. And he said, you know, I just, I don't know. I think you're supposed to have that. He said, I'm going to call them and tell them that I'm appointing you to that one that it's not about what they choose. And then he said this, and he said, you know what, I think I'm going to come up on the very first night you meet, and I want to, as the owner, I want to tell them how much I believe in you, and I'm going to sit in your first session just to show them that I support you. And then he said this, he said, and I've heard a lot of great things. He said, so um, I've got two other of these groups that don't have anybody doing them. I want you to take both of those as well, and I want you to do that as well. And so he restored what I lost, he publicly reaffirmed me, and then he gave me double what I had lost. Listen. That's amazing. Only God can do that. Now listen to me. Listen, listen. I learned in that moment that the person who gains the most when you forgive is the person who forgives. Because we're, listen, we're not dependent on people. We're putting ourselves in the hand of a God who judges justly. And if I do what he says, he'll do what I can't.